On November 9th, 2018, Activision Blizzard made a statement that Destiny 2 Forsaken, quote, did not achieve our commercial expectations, and that it, quote, underperformed against expectations to date. This would result in the game studio Bungie going on to say that, quote, we set out to build a game that Destiny players would love, and at Bungie, we love it too. Building Destiny for players who love it is and will remain our focus going forward. Bungie would soon leave Activision to split off to make the game they always envisioned Destiny being. But this DLC was that turning point. After one of the worst years a single video game could have, Bungie would set out to make the biggest DLC they had ever made. But this time for the fans of Destiny, and not for the people who didn't like Destiny. Now with the game's live service and sunsetting model, Destiny 2 Forsaken is soon to go away. The question I want to answer for you is, how? How did this DLC change the course of Destiny history? How did Activision see this as a loss? Finally, why does almost every Destiny player call this the best DLC ever made? This video is going to be incredibly long, so I encourage you to watch this in doses or just champ it out to the end if you really want to. This video will only briefly touch on seasons from that year, but if you want to see me cover the seasons from that year of Destiny, be sure to leave me a comment here or on my Twitch at EvanF1997. As always, I encourage you to try some free samples of gamer subs or use code Evan at checkout for a better alternative to energy drinks and coffee with no bullshit in it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get into it. Forsaken four years later. Activision Blizzard wrote off Destiny 2 as a game that could not meet their expectations, a player base so ready to be disappointed after Destiny the franchise not only had a bad vanilla Destiny 2, but also a controversial launch in Destiny 1. Convincing someone to come back to Destiny after the first year of Destiny 2 was like telling someone to go to a restaurant and hope the chef's choice wasn't going to give you food poisoning again. Let me put you in the space of a player in 2018 before Forsaken. There was only, uh, well, few games to compete with. And Destiny was lost to so many players. Hate threads popping up every week. Player interest at an all-time low. The biggest content creators in the world for Destiny at the time moved on to other avenues. The damage of vanilla Destiny 2 still has impact to this day, but I think the numbers hurt more than anything else, with Destiny 2 going from a great launch of 8.4 million concurrent players on the game to a staggering 600,000 active players in the Warmind expansion. These numbers were right after a launch of Trials of the Nine in Warmind again, and Reddit user Killtrend in the same post goes on to explain that quote, basically only about 20% more people than usual logged on to play the new trials after the update. That's laughably low when the average is like 50k or something in that ballpark. It's bad. It's very bad. For example, 49k played the week before the update. 63k played the week of the update. That's with basically every main streamer coming back to at least attempt a card. The hype's not even strong enough to break 100k. And Trials was always one of the biggest Destiny 1 draws during slow periods. Sure, the spaces in the game were still cool, and guns were still fun to shoot. 
but there was a deliberate attempt in year one to limit abilities. Take away RNG, which is at the core of Destiny. Make the game slower, put all the ways to earn levels and exotics in public events, Eververse items were through the roof on pricing, and everything was just disappointing. Think about it like this. There was nothing wrong with enjoying the game for a week or two, but the live service fun element was gone knowing that the game could be finished in a matter of a week or two, and there was no incentive to be in the end game at all. I can remember desperately wanting to play Destiny, but there was just nothing to do. Not even PvP was fun with 4v4 matchmaking just turning into laning fights, so the game was just empty. It felt like a game Bungie asked a focus group who hated Destiny 1 what they wanted the game to be. For Activision, it might have been a way to get those sales up to match their other massive giant of a game that comes out every single fall. You may already know what I'm about to say next. The Destiny is a dead game? In January and February of 2018, I would actually agree. With the game posting a staggeringly low 15,000 peak viewers in January and 8,000 in February. This isn't after an expansion, this is after the big launch. Twitch may not paint the whole picture, but it is a sign if the highest number of people watching is still that low, especially in combination with a dwindling player base that was getting more frustrated every day. This era was Destiny 2 as a husk of its former self, and it would take a miracle for this franchise to recover. No, it would take a complete rebirth at the foundation of Destiny for that to happen. Fast forward from the worst received Destiny expansion, The Curse of Osiris, past the moderately received expansion Warmind, where Bungie would release the Go Fast update. An update focused on speed, power, fun, energy, became the foundation, and the game was basically reworked from the ground up. Then, later that summer, at E3 2018, Cade 6's death was live for millions of people to watch, but it showed the balls that Bungie had to kill off the most beloved character in a teaser trailer. Bungie then goes on a complete redemption arc, releasing trailer after trailer, interviews, statements, everything on how Forsaken is for the community that loves Destiny. No longer would Destiny 2 try to appease everybody in an attempt to boost sales. Instead, with the help of Vicarious Visions and High Moon Studios, Bungie would steer that unstoppable ship in the other direction. Oh man, all this great hair to play Forsaken with. I love it. Let me just wash it. <sighs> Have you? Where did he go? Who? Who are you? My name, Doctor Keeps. Why are you wearing your doctor's coat as a bib? The year is twenty twenty two. Two thirds of men are going bald, but. I have this one trick that might just work. Have you tried? Keeps? Keeps is a clinically proven research back treatment to stop hair loss and improve hair growth. Wait, is there more than one treatment? Not only is there more than one treatment, but there are a huge group of doctors who are there to help you from stop going bold, as well as award-winning shampoo and conditioner. Oh my God, this sounds great. Where do I go for this? All you must do is open interwebs. Go to www.keeps.com slash Evan50 and you can start your subscription service today. That is www.keeps.com slash E-V-A-N 50 to start your subscription service today.
Oh my God, Doc, I'm back. Thank you. Make sure you guys check out the link in the description. Now, let's get back to the video. I am going to start this section of the video from most players' perspectives going into Destiny 2 Forsaken. Players coming off of the news of Forsaken bringing the game back to random roles, special weapons separate from heavy weapons, and a new feature where you could rock two special weapons and one heavy weapon. Forsaken would have players needing to be power level 380 to start the campaign, so I can remember jumping back into Escalation Protocol for the Ikelos shotgun, grabbing the Whisper of the Worm exotic sniper, and grinding my Solstice of Heroes armor sets to get as prepared as possible. In the weeks coming, Bungie would show off a new mode, Gambit. For one weekend, you could play it for no rewards, just a tease. Bungie would even tease players with a random rolled piece of armor or weapon from Forsaken for simply just completing the Mars Flashpoint Powerful. On August 28th, a week before Forsaken, this wasn't supposed to drop, but it did, and players flocked to it immediately to get something from Forsaken early. To top this off, there were even new perks on the armor, so speculation and wonder crept in. If you started playing Destiny during or after Shadowkeep, random rolled armor may sound weird, but Forsaken had both armor and weapons to roll at random. No slotting mods at all. Another thing players take for granted if they started in the Shadowkeep to now era is the leveling system. Destiny 2 had a pretty rough time with leveling in year 1, with exotics always being a powerful drop to max level, and public events on Heroic giving exotics fairly regularly. This meant just do public events for max level. Forsaken would completely change that equation, and we still have its leveling for the most part to this day. Getting back to this time, this was the longest break I ever took from Destiny. Curse of Osiris all the way till Solstice of Heroes. That's December to August, and not only did it feel amazing to have all of my own criticisms of vanilla Destiny 2 remedied, but it felt even fucking nicer to feel like Bungie was making a DLC for the community that loved Destiny, baby! Forsaken would cost $40 at launch, with a brand new seasonal content model that would cost $10 per season, raising it to $70 for the year. I think players at the time were hesitant to spend that much for another chance that Destiny could be like the previous year, and it didn't help that the game also had the spark of light catch-up mechanic for players with multiple characters to spend another $30 to skip the campaign on their alts. Something that now with the Witch Queen is gone and players get to start at a level playing field. It's also been reported that the Witch Queen has a million pre-orders. So yeah, I think a lot of people want to come back. So this era of Bungie had something massive to make. So how did it go, man? Thus far, Bungie has delivered on all fronts and then some. They've not only brought back what made me love the first Destiny when it was at its best, but also added a ton of requests that fans, myself included, have wanted for years. This is, this is significantly better than that. Like structurally, uh, quality of content, variety of things to do. Yeah. Kind of its staying power, how much it kind of keeps you going after you've kind of seen what there is to see. Like it's better in every right. aspect. Yeah. Uh, than that base game. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. That's uh, like I said, it to me it, it seemed like they're just they're using more parts. Like the stuff All in all, I am having a good initial experience with Forsaken. Destiny 2 at launch did not evolve the game at all and was actually more of a regression. With Forsaken, the game has gotten a lot better as a whole. The tone changes are very noticeable. We have a lot of quality of life improvements, and overall, I think Bungie and their partners have really stepped up with Forsaken. How we'll feel about it a few weeks from now remains a mystery, but for now, I think we're well within so far so good territory. If you were a fan of the game before, this is going to be exactly what you wanted Destiny to be from the start. 
If you haven't played it yet, now is the perfect time to jump in. There's something here for everyone, and the new bounties and triumphs add plenty to do for the hardened completions. Forsaken harkens back to the glory days of The Taken King, where the game proudly moved beyond its confused beginnings as a shared world shooter, and embraced a vision of itself that was deeper, more demanding, more complex, and more rewarding. The results are brilliant with Forsaken, and the game is once again wonderful. Forsaken hit us with a fucking nuke of content. As IGN says, it is a little something for everyone. So before I get ahead of myself, let me just start at the beginning. Major spoiler here. See that charismatic robot? Yeah, he's dead. Like, never coming back dead. It was an odd move for Bungie to kill the most fleshed out character in the series as a part of the opening of the campaign. Cade started out as this humorous, but also a grim killer in Destiny 1, almost like a true lone wolf. But in vanilla Destiny 2, he just became too jokey, becoming a symbol of just how out of touch the game felt. In Forsaken, it was like Bungie killed just about everything vanilla Destiny 2 offered, including its poster child. This also felt like a shot directly at Activision, since Cade was all over the promotions for the game. The campaign started off with a trip to the Prison of Elders, but not the mode from Destiny 1, instead inside of the prison players had heard so much about. The campaign starts off with the player helping Cade 6 and Patch Revenge stop a prison break. Cade was voiced by Nolan North instead of Nathan Fillion for this DLC, since he wouldn't be around for too long. Cade and the player go off on a wacky adventure, fighting all kinds of enemies, stopping to kick a soccer ball or two, and even seeing some friendly faces? Eventually ending with Cade falling down into the depths of the prison. This is when we were introduced to the brand new enemy race in Destiny 2. Bring out the scorn! <laughs> this cutscene is a cinematographer's wet dream, showing off all of Cade's arsenal, including the new super to Forsaken, Blade Barrage. You can feel the impact even more when his ghost gets killed, rendering Cade weak and no escape possible. The player then rushes down the prison and is promptly introduced to the scorn themselves. This was well done, showing off all new abilities the Scorn had while showing how menacing and creepy and gross and icky and ooh boogers. Well, I say all of that, but there's also a scream down here that I named Screvin since it doesn't attack at all. It just chills here and is invincible. So like, there's Screvin! Oh my god. Screvin! Screvin? No. The player follows the trail all the way down to where Cade fell down and is introduced to the first abomination. Now, I always thought this enemy type was an ogre mix, but it's actually a mega zombie dreg that's just been juiced up with gamer subs. Uh, use, use code Evan, by the way. Anyways, after this boss goes down, we see the true antagonist of Forsaken revealed. Aldrin Sav. He didn't feel a thing. <laughs> Who had some weird stuff going on with his eyes and is speaking with a different tone, like he's possessed. He kills Cade, and soon Cade's funeral commences. Ikora sends in the troops to take back the reef, and now that Marasov is presumed dead from the Taken King days, and Aldrinsov has gone rogue in the Forsaken days, this place is a wasteland. The very first time seeing the Tangled Shore felt desolate, depressing, and just something out of a western. It wasn't underwhelming, it just kind of felt like another location like one we'd been accustomed to in vanilla Destiny 2. But one thing stood out, there was a looming watchtower in the distance. There were even better lost sectors out here, and one was even a party lost sector. So every Destiny player banked all of their sadness at the party lost sector. The environment really encapsulated Cade's death because after he died, it was like starting from nothing again. 
the player then moved through a secret wall and then was introduced to more scorn barons staring at you from a cliff. This is how you establish your villains. After this introduction, the player made another introduction. This one was not Scorn, but instead Fallen that worked for a guy that we'll get to pretty quickly. The player saw more of the Scorn Barons as well, including one on a pike riding around. Then we met the Spider. This guy would have multiple purposes. For the campaign, he was a helper, but not really a friend. For the post-campaign, he was a friend because you could get powerful loot from bounties, and we love bounties, to hunt down enemies. There was also a very rare chance you'd get the returning exotic Lord of Wolves, and a guaranteed chance that you would get materials from this guy. The spider always seemed like a character that was one step ahead of you, and at any moment he could have you killed if you didn't cooperate. Petrovenge was also here to give you your very first bow in Destiny. A brand new weapon type to Forsaken, and my god, do these things feel nice to shoot. This bow wasn't good compared to the others, but I mean, like, come on, man, it's a, it's a bow. Like, it's so clean. It's so much fun. Petra and the spider had the player doing some busy work and then a mission to kill the Fanatic's champion. After killing the Fanatic's champion, the spider made us do every Destiny player's guilty pleasure. Bounties, baby, let's go! These may seem easy, but the Tangled Shore had areas that were 505 power, and we were a max of 420 power at this point. We had some busy work to do, and public events, something everyone hated in Vanilla Destiny 2, had a new one on the Tangled Shore. You could tell already that this DLC was made to be the complete opposite of Vanilla Destiny 2 in every way, making the player work their butt off even in the campaign. Once those five bounties were done, it was time to be introduced to the names of the Scorn. Rexus Vaughn, the Hangman. Canix, or better known as Scorn Tanix, the Mad Bomber. Araskis, the Trickster. Kirax, the Mindbender. Yavix, the rider, the one who shot Cade's ghost, Pyria, the rifleman, Elicris, the machinist, and our fence head friend, whose curse is that he cannot die, Fikrul, the fanatic. All of these scorn barons were led by one man, the man who put the final bullet in Cade, Aldrin Sav. Seven scorn and one crow to hunt down and kill in this western bounty hunter story of revenge. You could fight them in any order you wanted at launch, with these missions just being adventures. The power level varied between 390 and 440, but most players were going to suffer if they did all of these in a row without stopping to get some loot just from exploring the Tangled Shore incentivizing people to explore the area. So for the sake of this video, I am gonna go easiest to hardest mission. Yavix, AKA the Rider, the leader of a bombastic gang of pike riding eaters. They sow chaos everywhere they ride. The first mission had the player bounty hunting down the rider on a pike that they needed to calibrate and assemble. With some wonderful sound design and visual design for the rider in an area that gave off a true Mad Max showdown. With Forsaken, the player didn't have any breaks between missions of killing the Barons. No padding like the series had been panned for. No wasting time just get right into the fights. The power level of each mission, like we discussed, increased, incentivizing players to explore the shore. But you also didn't have to. You were going to get shit on by the bosses, but they did all drop a piece of forsaken loot, whether it be armor or weapons. Remember, random rolls were new again, so everything you got was super exciting. Even cooler was that the drops from the missions were all tied to the Tangled Shore, so there was no world loot pool here, just reef-exclusive drops. 
The dialogue in these missions was admittedly very bad, and we counted how many times Cade was mentioned as a piece of filler, even jokingly making it a drinking game to take a shot every time someone said Cade. Oh. Alright, we're on the Cade count number two. Next one up! The trickster, Araskis. A liar and a schemer. Friendly advice. Trust nothing she touches. This enemy had exotic engrams that were bombs, and heavy ammo bricks that were bombs, and chests that were fake? This was the Grasp of Avarice before the Grasp of Avarice. And if you've played the Season of the Lost Astro Alignment, the Trickster model shows up as one of the bosses, but with another Baron's mechanics we will talk about later. The Trickster was a tease. I wanted all of the Forsaken exotics, I didn't want some stupid bombs instead. I wanted this secret chest that had me blowing up doors and spawning ships to blow up more doors. I didn't want a material that was useless instead, but the Trickster didn't care. So I killed the trickster. Canics, the mad bother. Emphasis on mad. Demolitions expert with an irritating way about him. The next mission was against the mad bomber, who was very happy to tell you that Cade died. This mission at the release of Forsaken had players a bit on edge, since the zones to dismantle his bombs had a tight timer, and you were under leveled so the stress really built up. The finale of this mission even had an escape section with some well designed enemy placement in certain spots. You know, what was the Mad Bomber thinking, putting a one minute timer on this thing? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. It's Ian, okay. Oh! Wait, we actually died. Wait, we're t We suck. <laughs> Bruh. Go, 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 go. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, guys. I really like this mission. And I could tell that Bungie put in a lot of effort, having those swinging lantern enemies right next to mines that could blow you up in a tight zone while you're trying to dismantle more mines. After the Mad Bomber came the Hangman. Rex is fun, the Hangman. The silent sadist used to dock the arms of drags with his bare hands. A baron that kidnapped and murdered Spider's henchmen. That's, that's pretty dark. This dude may look familiar if you've played the mission Presage, but this was his original story. Swinging a big lamp and attracting every moth in the general vicinity. I feel like they just didn't know what boss to put into Presage because there's no like new thing for the scorn. So they were like, you know what? Hangman. I found this Baron to be the most forgettable of the bunch for no real reason. He was just kind of basic compared to the rest. The next one up and probably my favorite Baron was the Mindbender. Hyrax, the Mindbender, has a rep for manipulation, has a morbid obsession. This boss was trying to be Galron before it was cool to be Galron, and he had a funny hat to command the hive. He also had the name of everyone's favorite shotgun, the Mindbender's Ambition. What made this one stand out was that he commanded the hive. He had a spooky ritual in front of a door. He had an ascendant plane with tentacle monsters in the background. Sure. End game. In game, this guy's into some ribbon, ribbon tentacle stuff, you know? And had a secret emblem for those who made the climb to grab the key. The Mindbender had the most mystery, since he was a resurrected zombie that was trying to command a whole nother race of enemies. I almost wish the strike for the Mindbender's ambition was this mission and not the strike we received. The highest leveled Baron for the adventures was not trying to command other enemies but instead make copies of himself. The rifleman, Pirha, the only fallen alive who can make the shot that mortalized Cade Six. 
The Rifleman used the Queen Breaker's bow, an exotic that would come back in this DLC to kill Cade's ghost and every invader in Gambit. After you beat the Rifleman, his eventual punishment was that players would just material farm off of him. So yeah, that's what you get for killing Cade, bud. I really enjoyed this fight since it was an area we never visited again, until I found out that this area was the home to the PlayStation exclusive strike. Now that PlayStation owns Bungie, don't, don't, please, please don't, please no more exclusives, man. This was also the other half of the Astro Alignment boss fight, being the mechanic to the Trickster's model. The Rifleman went down like the rest and was a pretty fun fight being underleveled. All right, now that the adventures were done, we get to see just what Aldrin Sav was really up to. Petra really should have been on a controller for that snipe. Oh my god, throw on a targeting adjuster mod. How do you miss that? Either way, Aldrin became a Sith Lord and now had a shard of light from the Traveler to do some spooky bad guy stuff. We have the light and we used it on the next mission. The Machinist, aka you got sad it wasn't Siva. This mission was an all out war with tanks enemies everywhere, just full D-Day style. The machinist had some neat mechanics, launching missiles from her back into the air and down at you like a javelin missile. Once the machinist went down, it was time to take out the big guns, but not before another cutscene. Please, brother, will you walk through hell for me one last time? Yes. Free us. This mission, the final one, took place inside that giant watchtower that's been looming over the Tangled Shore the whole time. And we were now on our way over there. Immediately when this mission started, is when I knew what Bungie was really hiding. Something mysterious, yet holy in this tower. The conclusion to this campaign. This one starts off with a very lackluster fight against the Fnatic, and then up the stairs into the tower. The scannables in this area suggested that these pieces of architecture were untouched since the beginning of time, and that where we were on the compass had no coordinates. Once we entered the portal to an ascendant realm and through all of these Taken enemies? Oh my god, are we fighting the Taken and the Scorn? We arrived at the reveal of the DLC's real villain. You brave, devoted, pathetic. being possessed is swallowed by a voice of an enemy named Riven but this isn't Riven herself yet let me just let me let me, let me, let me just back it up a little bit all right <clears throat> lore 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 Riven is a magic dragon who gave Aldrin the ability to bring back the dead fallen called the scorn and this is why he became a Sith Lord earlier 
but he's really just a pawn for Riven to break free from her cage. All right, there you go. Does that make more sense? Maybe not, maybe, I don't know. This fight against this giant toothy, dude, it, why did they have to make it look like an a meatball was ridiculously difficult and would take a lot of attempts to beat. Once the job was done, however, Aldrin was spat out and we had the last word. Now where's my sister? She's not here, Aldrin. And if she was, this would be a whole lot easier. If Cade was here, I know what he would do, Guardian. Do you? You have his gun. Seems you get the last word. <laughs> Funny. The line between light and dark is so very thin. Do you know which side you're on? This was a solid experience of a campaign that if you were to play back in those days would take about 10 to 12 hours to finish. This was a true leg up of a campaign. And while I'm not going to say it was a Legend of Zelda quality good, it was a vast improvement to what players were used to. You gotta remember, a lot of Destiny campaigns players were accustomed to was just to protect a box or maybe three good missions just three good missions, and that's kind of it. The final steps for the DLC were to just talk to Ikora and Zavala one last time. You didn't think it ended there, did you? Well, when young Evan played this mission for the first time, he had no clue that this would be the introduction to the real package that Destiny 2 Forsaken would offer. I'm gonna give credit to everybody still watching this video. Thank you so, so much. Because while other people clicked away, you stayed for the best part of the DLC. And just like the reward for watching this far in brings the best content of this video, this was the reward for young Evan reaching the Dreaming City. Everything we saw in the promotional material, the death of Cade, the Scorn Barons, Aldrin Sov, that plot was just the introduction to the Dreaming City. The Dreaming City was the exact contrast of the Tangled Shore. While the Shore felt like a better version of the destinations we had in Year 1, the Dreaming City felt new, in the same way that the Dreadnought felt new for Destiny 1 in The Taken King. If the prison made a great introduction to the Scorn, then the Dreaming City was a great introduction to the end game. The first areas you see are clouded in mist and have an Ahamkara bone to collect. The second area you see introduces you to bosses you'll fight later, Shurochi, Kali, and Sedia, all enemies you would fight in the end game of Forsaken. Next up was Tolan a character who was almost like a motif for the series being a guide through the Ascendant Plane. He tells you that you're not supposed to be there, and to run away from the Dreaming City before it's too late. This signals to the player that this is where the resources for Forsaken really went. Once in the Oracle Room, meeting once again with Petrovenge, the real plot began. The establishment of how great the Dreaming City was going to be was right from the get-go. Marasov is alive, the real one this time, not a voice of Riven, and Petra warns the player that there is an immense creature at the heart of this city that we must prepare to slay. The Dreaming City, very much like the Tangled Shore, established the stakes for the destination from the very start. 
if the goal of Forsaken Campaign was to kill Aldrin Sav, then the goal of the endgame was to kill Riven. Unlike the Tangled Shore, however, the Dreaming City will be staying around after the Witch Queen's release. So I encourage everyone watching this video to explore the secrets of the Dreaming City yourself before I go through some of them. If you have already, or just don't care to do it now, then continue watching. The Dreaming City was now free to explore, but there was something exciting around every corner. Let me explain why this place was so grand. It wasn't that there was just secrets, it was that the secrets were guarded by enemies that were most of the time question marks on the screen. They were that overleveled for you. It wasn't that there was a boss, it's that more bosses kept coming and getting stronger after each one was killed, always asking you to wonder what kind of loot they had. All the new random rolls with all the new loot exclusive to the Dreaming City activities kept the interest high, and with exotics being incredibly rare, the excitement to play for the most overpowered exotics the franchise had ever seen was incredibly strong. The minimum power level to really stand any chance in the Dreaming City was going to be 505. That's 25 levels higher than the campaign's final mission, and power was also not going to come easy in Forsaken. The biggest criticism Destiny 2 received in Year 1 was that max power could be achieved via public events and just farming those over and over again, leaving no incentive to play the endgame. In Year 2, Bungie reinvented the ways to earn levels and it's still mostly the same system players have today. RNG was the focus of the power grind, and nowadays we have duplicate drop protection, ways to pad out levels, armor-specific farming, etc. In Forsaken, there was none of that, leading to you potentially getting 10 helmet drops in a row as powerfuls with almost no bumps in level. Oh yeah, the levels were also going to be hard to come by since the soft cap was 500 power and 600 was the max level. So have fun grinding a bunch of plus ones or plus three armor and weapons stacked with this RNG. No season pass to save you either. The only other new thing introduced to help you was Prime Engrams, a new engram introduced in Forsaken. These would drop a few per week on your characters and incentivize you to just kill enemies out there in the field to get one to drop, boosting the level quite a bit. There was also daily and weekly powerfuls that would reset every few days and nothing but incentive to be in the end game all over. This was a loop built for Forsaken, and a long power climb to enjoy the content. You were going to get run over by everything that stood in your way. But that, to me, was the fun of the DLC. Overcoming a challenge, getting excited knowing that I would come back to an area later stronger than ever. The Dreaming City was the place where Destiny 2 players got their supers too. And let's really quickly talk about that. There were nine new supers introduced here, with all three elements of all three classes getting something new. You could even get one of your choices in the main campaign to play with and upgrade. So not only were you getting new supers like the infamous Well of Radiance, Cade's Blade Barrage, or the Burning Maul Hammer for Titans, you also had new ones to earn in the endgame. The Blind Well was the place to earn the other supers and upgrade them. The well had you facing the scorn and had tiers of charges only purchased from Petra out in the city, facing waves of enemies as they flooded in. Using the charges on the ground to power your super and getting super kills to upgrade your super tree all the way over was the loop here. The blind well was always missing some exclusive armor and weapons in my opinion, but the goal for getting supers and some levels from the drops made it okay at the time. It was almost like a Court of Oryx 3.0. Uh, I guess 4.0 because there was the one in Rise of Iron, then there was Escalation 4.0. Now this activity could have taken a while, but the exotic Telesto made this one easy for players in the first few weeks, and gave me the false sense of confidence that the bosses would be easy too. A race against the clock with the bosses and barely with nine players in the arena, beating them for some powerful drops and a chance at the Seed of Light for a new super. 
there was no chance anyone was attempting a tier 3 blind well for weeks and definitely not messing with that unstable charge of light either. At tier three, everything was a skull and the unstable charge had question mark enemies. So no thank you for now. The offering of the Oracle was the bounty reward from this one after a long grind and a trip to the starting mission area. This was just for another piece of loot, but we'll come back to this stuff later. Trust me, it gets juicy. The Dreaming City also had powerful secret loot in the Ascendant Challenges. By using a drop only from the Dreaming City, called the Tincture of Queen's Foil, the areas around you changed. New platforms appeared where they weren't before. New spaces could be discovered. Portals that weren't there before. A whole new shortcut route in the Dreaming City even some Ahamkara bones as vendors to buy these from, and these challenges in a new spot every week. The bar was raised incredibly high for destinations after the Ascendant challenges provided one a week for six straight weeks, all with different objectives. This really felt like the sequel to Destiny 1's Dreadnought. Some had you make a vertical climb to get to the boss, others had a fall to the bottom, some had you race against the clock, while others had you taking it at your own pace. These challenges always had these floating eggs, and these Ahamkara bones. These bones and eggs were collectibles for the title Cursebreaker. Titles were something brand new here, and incentivized further challenges in the Dreaming City a player might not want to normally partake in for a name on your character. These were the first titles, and getting all of the new triumphs to show off your score just added to the level of quality Forsaken provided to the player. There are 40 eggs to collect, and 16 Ahamkara bones with most of the bones and eggs being hidden around the city in various activities, all the way from public events to the raid and something we'll get to later. The Ascendant Challenges being a place for collecting loot and gaining levels, while also having Toland around to explain some more of the story of the city to the player. This was also a good time to fill out those Dreaming City collections, which didn't reveal all the loot to the player before they owned it like the collection tab does now. It was new, and to me, it should have always stayed mysterious like back then. Mysterious is a good way to describe Ascendant Challenges though, as these challenges just stayed difficult in power level. You could see Bungie's level design on full display, a design that as a Destiny player, you just knew a team of developers was having a blast while making. Some portions of the Dreaming City were just as chaotic as they were peaceful. You may find a waterfall with a gang of enemies around, just as you may find a moss-covered cathartic gazebo with nothing around. My favorite portions of the Dreaming City have to be these hidden fast travel locations, since they are cleverly disguised portals that take the player to the hideout of the city. There's no enemies around, just the peace of walking through the landscape. You may even stumble across a giant wall that looks like it could have something going on one day. But we'll talk about that later, you know, trust, trust me on that one. The Dreaming City had a learning curve to even navigate it, and each of these sections had an enemy that was power level 590 guarding them. These enemies were spooky, and even spookier is that they were hiding, so it was always an optional challenge. On top of this exploration, players started to find these weird plates with symbols on them. Wonder what that could be. I wonder if there was a place for these symbols to be used. Last wish, the best raid ever made. The place for the symbols to be used, but not on day one. Welcome to the raid Last Wish. A raid that Bungie went on the record and promised was the biggest raid they had ever made. A raid that would take 10 days after the DLC's launch to release. A raid that was so intimidating that the most prepared players in the world were still 30 levels under the final challenges. Let me say this about the raid. No matter how much you thought you were prepared, however many prime engrams you had farmed, 
However lucky you got, you weren't ready for this one. Only two teams would beat this raid in 24 hours for the emblem. Team Redeem beat the raid first in 18 hours and 48 minutes, getting the brand new exotic fusion rifle that was a heavy weapon, 1000 voices, and the first ever raid championship belt, as well as each member receiving an emblem for completing the raid within 24 hours. If you want to watch the full story of this race, be sure to check out my Last Wish video. Last Wish introduced the most boss fights in Destiny since King's Fall, with an epilogue fight that hasn't been done since. Last Wish also gave the final super from beating the first encounter with Callie the Corrupted. As Bungie promised, it was the largest raid to date, with reasons to do the raid every week. This raid introduced a whole new era of raid mods like taking armaments to just get heavy ammo on taking grenade kills, and taking barrier to just take less damage from the taken. Look, no protective light was on back then, so this was huge. There was also a heavy emphasis on curated weapons in Forsaken, with multiple places they could drop in the raid. A curated weapon was introduced in Forsaken, and it was a weapon that came pre-masterwork with a roll that Bungie gave static to it. You gotta remember, random rolls were new again in Forsaken after all, and random rolls were brand new to a raid in Last Wish. So some sort of static drop to get was the extra incentive on top, with Nation of Beasts and Arc Fatebringer being the best curated one from this raid. Last Wish also had the tremendous reveal of the real villain of the Forsaken story, Riven of 1000 Voices. This dragon that takes on a ton of voices was the voice in Aldrin Sov's head in the campaign, and she was Queen Marasov's biggest secret, the last known Ahamkara locked away in the tower. The story gets really complex, and I recommend you watch my 15th Wish video to learn more, but basically the pecking order goes Scorn, who are raised from the dead by a possessed Aldrin Sov, who is at the control of Riven, but then after the raid, the world's first team unlocked a cutscene to reveal the villain, pulling the strings the whole time. This cutscene is infamous in Destiny, revealing so much at once. Killing Riven set off a curse in the Dreaming City. It was a trick by our main antagonist in the Witch Queen, Savathun. Savathun's ploy would be discovered after the raid was beaten even more, changing the entire Dreaming City into a cursed state. With Taken everywhere, in the Blind Well, a part of patrol spaces, new missions, a brand new strike, a brand new gambit map, a brand new crucible map, and in Bungie's biggest endgame secret, the Shattered Throne. This was a brand new activity for Destiny called a dungeon, something nowadays players are accustomed to. But back then, this 590 power level activity was the final test for players. This and the raid were the hardest places in the game and gave the incentive to level up all year. These were the places where the final eggs and bones were for the title. And for the Shattered Throne, this was hidden for days after it was accessible to players. You remember that odd wall in the peaceful zone? Well, a freed Shurochi from the raid was standing at the gate to tell you all about the throne. We have also made a video on the Shattered Throne, but this was the final test with tremendous level design for Destiny being a three-player raid experience instead of six. The draw of this dungeon was the Wish Ender Exotic Quest, which had players revisiting hidden portions of the Tangled Shore and accessing secrets in the throne for the bow that could break all those damn eggs in the city. The next big draw was the fact that the throne only came around on Curse Week, so every three weeks, and had the ship for the Curse Breaker title. So good luck getting that to drop once a month. There was other fun tidbits, 
like an emblem for doing the dungeon solo, the satisfaction of killing Savathun's daughter, the amount of drops from this, and nowadays, the throwaway, which is the best farm in the game for XP, and catalysts. If you want to learn about this dungeon some more, please watch my dungeon video. The Curse Week also unlocked the Wish Wall in the raid, and the biggest hunt and mystery in Destiny's history. The hunt for 15 wishes, a mystery that may be solved in the supposed Savathun exorcism mission. This week also had one more hidden area attached to it. Not only did the Blind Well have a new boss, but bringing the offering to the Oracle on Curse Week allowed the player their first face-to-face -face meeting with Marasov in the game. Remember, we talked about that Blind Well and how difficult it was. So somewhere out in deep space sat the reward and the satisfaction of finally meeting the Queen of the Awoken. And things changed in here almost every time it was Curse Week, with one week her meeting you, another week a pyramid ship showing up on the table, a cutscene with Aldrin Sov coming back to life, Mara getting mad at our ghost, and just so much more. There is so much we could go over for you guys, like the raid challenges, the lore books, the 999 power fiasco, etc. But I think at this point, I've exhausted you guys on how much there was, and as a player back then, I was nothing but overwhelmed with joy in this place. So I hope you now understand why the Dreaming City is the best destination that Bungie has ever made, in my opinion. This place set such an unbelievable standard that I would go out and say it did just as much harm as it did good. Because nowadays, if something doesn't align with being this quality that I know Bungie is capable of, it just feels a little empty. I don't want that sentence to be taken the wrong way. I mean, I still love Destiny, but this raised the bar so high. What do you think, though? Was the Dreaming City really this good? Was there something better? Or am I overblowing it? Leave me a comment. The Dreaming City may have raised the bar so high for the PvE content, but what about the rest of the game? Oh yeah! Gambit, that mode that I don't think people like so much nowadays, and is getting reworked for reasons that make a lot of sense. But it was new, and so much fun at the beginning. So what happened? Well, Gambit dropped with three new maps, and one even newer map after the raid was beaten. This whole mode had its own desirable loot pool with weapons to chase like Truth and Bygones. The mode introduced a crossover of PvP and PvE with the, at the time, new moat mechanic. I know moats get joked about nowadays because the moat mechanic is a part of just about everything in Destiny, but you gotta understand that this was new then, and new was a part of everything in Gambit. The maps, the flow, the mix of PvP in a traditionally PvE environment. This mode also had good incentive with new armor sets, new weapons to chase, it was a source of getting levels, and there was a secret exotic quest with that fourth map during Curse Week. Curse Week dropped that Dreaming City map and a rare chance at a new boss. The Prime Evil Evil. This boss is now a common boss, but then this one was incredibly rare with the stakes raised because if you were the team to kill it first, you got the Malfeasance quest to drop. It encouraged Gambit sweating and Gambit's only problem that really still remains true was heavy ammo abusing with armaments. This quest included a very, very hard version of the Corrupted Strike, with some new objectives for the exotic hand cannon. There was even a bug when this quest first dropped to have like 10 people in the strike, so that's fun. This mode would eventually evolve into where it is today, but damn, I can remember really enjoying this mode when it first came out. It was a huge step forward and leaking with potential. The only real problems, like we said, were heavy ammo economies, invader spawns and advantages, and just the length of the games. It started to feel stale and not enough mix of variety after a while. 
it felt like Bungie needed to update it and just left it in the dust. Still, full of potential. Also having tons of potential, we have PvP and Forsaken. This game mode was helped like the others by having a complete vendor refresh and loot tied to the mode. This was not helped like the others, since the metas were so busted in this era. Like most topics related to the Dreaming City, we have a video on just how busted the Crucible was, but there was also such a charm in that first month or two. In the first month of Forsaken, Bungie restored PvP to 6v6, and in doing so, the maps got a lot more chaotic. Bungie also put special weapons and special ammo back in, so there was bricks just about everywhere. And to top it off, damage perks were very strong, like Kill Clip and Rampage being about a 30% bump. Exotic quests like the Chaperone from PvP and the tremendous Ace of Spades quest, which brought that gun into PvP, made this place a crazy nightmare. There were mods that made it even scarier, like super mods to have super in the first minute of the matches, in direct contrast to year one's slow abilities. It was full of new weapons for a while though, and that charm of not knowing the meta to run and not knowing what loot could drop was an overwhelming joy that added to Forsaken's legacy. There was even the very first pinnacle weapon quest in Crucible the season before in Warmind for the Redrix Claymore, then brought back in Forsaken with the Redrix Broadsword. The other new quest was Luna's Howl, a fantastic energy hand cannon followed by a secret pinnacle quest for the even better Not Forgotten. I absolutely love these hand cannons, since they really were the final steps for PvP's incentive to have something to work towards. The Crucible added four new maps for Xbox with an exclusive one on PlayStation, and one new mode with Breakpoint. We just gotta hope Sony doesn't pull that stuff with the Spongy deal. The maps weren't my favorite in the series, but I love that the game had enough space for everyone by giving PvP players this much love. So much love that even orgs got interested in Destiny PvP. Nowadays, that might be hard to believe, but again, this era was just that strong, even on the PvP side. Strong and Power Fantasy was the home of all modes, including the Gambit and the Crucible, but there had to be a supplier of that Power Fantasy, right? You know what I'm gonna say next. You didn't think I was gonna end this video without mentioning the exotics, did you? There was five kinetic weapon exotics, three energy exotics with Wave Splitter being a PlayStation exclusive, four heavy weapon exotics, and 12 armor exotics, four for each class with some reworked exotics that carried over from the Go Fast update. Guys, that is 24 exotics, and almost all of them were insane. I can say out of the 12 exotic armor pieces, three warlock exotics were nerfed, two hunter exotics were nerfed, and for Titans, all four Titan exotics were technically nerfed at some point. For the weapons, four of them were nerfed at some point too. The exotics that were released with Forsaken were meant to be menacing and take into account that Rally Barricades, Healing Rifts, and the Well of Radiance were also auto-reloading weapons. This year was meant to be a full-on power fantasy, and we haven't even talked about the debuffs and buff stacking, my god. Now, I also have to tell you that the odds of getting these exotics were so ridiculously low that a post popping up every day was made, and eventually over time, Bungie made the rate better and added duplication protection. That feeling of getting an exotic to drop really did feel like vanilla Destiny 1, and I miss this feeling. If there's one thing that I want back in Destiny, it's exotics being rare to get. But what do you think? I'd love to know in the comments. Exotics were incredibly rare, but you became a full-on Super Saiyan with one equipped. It also helped that most of these exotics synergized with the brand new supers. Again, nine new supers. And again, you can watch my video on this topic if you want to. But these exotics are mostly still the ones players use today. They were just that powerful, guys. Forsaken created a new destiny. But also, in some ways, it gave itself a free pass. Vanilla Destiny 2 had slow abilities, 
no random rolls, double primary weapons, a lot less varieties in the way to play, and a lot more monotonous grind that you could tell was just there to waste your time. Forsaken gave Destiny players exactly what they wanted from Destiny 1, with even more than they could possibly ask for. Every weapon was a new roll, and every weapon could be made for that year. The exotics, however, were made for this chaotic fun and ambitious of a year of destiny. Forsaken in the four years it has been a part of Destiny truly changed my life. I don't want to sound dramatic when I say that, I just truly mean that. When writing this video, I tried not to be so rose tinted with my glasses, but to look at what it provided to the Destiny player base at large. I really meant it when I said there was something for everyone, and we didn't even touch on all of it. If you don't believe me, Here's a speedrun of the topics we just scratched the surface of or haven't mentioned at all. Weapon 2.0, random weapons, random armor, titles, triumphs, leveling, pinnacle quests, collections tabs, subclasses, bounties, masterworks, raid banners, curated weapons, weapon mods, edge transit, prime engrams, ammo changes, element changes, inventory overhaul, mod consumable tab, vendor refresh completely. That is a lot to go over and things that you don't really think about when you play the game now. I mean, Eververse alone was a great experience in Forsaken, always having free ways to earn all the cosmetics every season. Speaking of seasons, they all offered something new, and in my opinion had the most replayability of any year of Destiny seasons with two raids, four activities, puzzles, and more being introduced in them. This was an era where Bungie had a lot of help from other studios to make great content happen, and while not always perfect, the Seasons of Forsaken were that cherry on top of the other cherries this DLC provided. I wanted to make this video to be a time capsule back into another era of Destiny, while also being a retrospective at how far a studio can fall, then get back up and climb again. I am very excited about the Witch Queen, but I hope you now understand what standard Bungie had set for themselves with Forsaken, and I hope you now understand why it pained me so much when Luke Smith went on the record to say Destiny wouldn't have another year like Forsaken. I really hope he was just kidding, or maybe times have changed now that this Sony acquisition happened. And I really hope I'm wrong. I hope that the Witch Queen is better than Forsaken. But either way, I expect it will be amazing, and I expect plenty more videos and stories to be shared. If you did enjoy this video, a like would be greatly appreciated as well as a subscription. Make sure to watch my live streams since I'm there most days and especially will be live with the Witch Queen. If you want that Seasons video, again, be sure to leave me a comment. I really appreciate you guys and uh, for Forsaken, goodbye. You were the best DLC I've ever played. Mmm.